<laughs> says here I am live. Um, welcome. My name is Jamis. I am a programmer at Waterloo Public Library. Uh, and welcome to our square foot gardening program. I am live in my own backyard. Um, I'm just going to hold the computer up. Behind me is my own garden, my own square foot garden. It's about three quarters planted. Started planting last weekend on the May 2 4. As many people start planting their vegetable gardens around that weekend. I'm going to talk a little bit today, actually, going to talk a lot today <laughs> about square foot gardening. Now, square foot gardening started off as a book right here. Um, it was written by a gentleman by the name of Mel Bartholomew. I uh, wrote it back in 1981. And this book was so popular, he even had a TV series on PBS, Square Foot Gardening TV series. Um, and it kind of changed the way a lot of people do a lot of gardening. I started doing it because it came highly recommended uh, for my grandparents. My, my mother's parents uh, had... A victory garden in their backyard for pretty much 50 straight years um, and when this book came out in 1981 uh, they started following it faithfully ever since so that was kind of all the uh, encouragement I needed since, since avid gardeners were so positive about this book um, that I started following it quite a bit um, we're gonna talk a little bit today about the general gist of square foot gardening um, I'll talk about the positives. We'll talk about some of the negatives. Not so much negatives as things you might want to look out for or change or do it a little bit differently. Um, and some adaptations that I have come up with. I'm sure, I'm sure, 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 if you talk to just about anyone who's an avid gardener, in this case, it's mainly vegetable gardening that we're talking about. Um, they all have their own little tips and techniques and tricks that they try and they've learned from various people over the years but definitely in terms of growing food um, square foot gardening has definitely become one of the most popular if not the most popular go-to guide for a lot of people now we do have the book we do carry multiple versions of square foot gardening at Waterloo Public Library so if you look up square foot gardening or even type in Mel Bartholomew the author's name um, you'll find plenty of listings both real books as well as ebooks as well too um, there has been many versions of square foot gardening. There's the original one that was released back in 1981. Um, it's been updated at least one time, if not twice. Uh, there's even a kid-friendly version of the book. So there's lots of lots of different resources. Um, there's also many, many resources online. If you type square foot gardening online uh, into any search engine, you'll, you'll find a bazillion pictures and a bazillion websites all espousing the methodology um, and also with people's unique little twists, because like I said, not everyone does it um, exactly as it's presented in the book. People have found things that work better or worse for them, depending really upon their personal situations. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Oh, one piece of housekeeping before I start getting more into the content. Um, we are, because this is streaming live uh, via YouTube and Facebook. Um, but if you do have questions or comments, um, I do see them. They do pop up. I get a little notification, and I can switch over and read the comments. So if you do have any questions, uh, type them into Facebook or YouTube, and I will eventually get notified, and I will do my best to get to and answer every one of them. Okay? Um, but I'm going to share my screen and say when most people think of gardening in general, um, or growing stuff, <laughs> farming, uh, most of the time people think of something like this, right? Uh, we have rows of plants being grown uh, with little dirt tracks in between. Main purpose of the dirt tracks, if you're, if you're growing vegetables on a farm, is to get farm equipment in there. So your tractor wheels usually are spaced out just right to fit into each one of those dirt tracks um, but still a lot of people carry over this technique uh, in their own backyard uh, growing food growing food in tracks like that in rows um, is popular because you can navigate down the rows right it makes it a little bit easier for weeding it helps a little bit of irrigation because the rows become these little valleys where water can get into um, it makes it a little bit easier for picking weeds and things like that um, and it's 
in just about everything. So when you go out and you buy seeds, so I have a package here, spinach seeds. Um, it talks about on the back, I have all the little details on this chart. This is fairly common for most seed packages. Um, but it talks about seed spacing. So the amount of room that you want between plants, basically, and then row width. So it's still talking about rows and like having nothing growing between those rows. Um, so it's fairly prevalent, this idea of growing your food in rows. Mel Bartholomew uh, was a former engineer and he thought that it was kind of wasteful. It was wasteful to grow food in rows like that. Um, so basically the main crux of square foot gardening is growing food densely. Uh, so we do away with rows altogether. Uh, and his technique basically is to organize your garden uh, into square feet, into square feet. Now I have here, this came in a little kit that I got. They have, there's all sorts of square foot gardening books, but also like things you can buy based on the square foot gardening theme. Someone once got me this square foot gardening plant pot, um, and it came with a planting guide, which I have used and abused ever since. Um, but basically, instead of planting in rows, depending upon the species of plant that we're growing, what exactly we're growing, we are either going to be planting things, uh, one plant per square foot. So this square here is a square foot, 12 inches by 12 inches. We either plant one thing per square foot. Uh, we plant either four things per square foot. Those are the orange circles. I don't know if you guys can quite see that it's brown, but also the sunlight's kind of washing it out. But it's four feet per square foot uh, of four plants per square foot, nine plants per square foot, which are the the darker brown circles here, so nine per square foot, and then 16 per square foot is the other method. There are some variations. There are some variations. I know when uh, you're growing vining beans, uh, they recommend four per square foot, and basically just use the middle six, uh, the middle eight. Sorry, the middle eight when you're growing eight per square foot. Sorry. <laughs> I know it's hard. It's easy to get mixed up with them. There's all sorts of charts and guides online and su suggested uh, growing densities, but that's that's the crux of it. The vast majority of plants um, you're growing either one plant in a square foot, four, nine, or sixteen. Um, so, and a very common example would be a tomato plant. A tomato plant you grow only one per square foot, one plant per square foot. So, you mark off a square foot and you plant right in the middle, right in the middle for that tomato plant. Um, the whole idea is that that you're going to be increasing the density of things that you grow, right? So instead of using those rows and spacing of the plants in each row, uh, we just take a square and we fill it with as much as possible. Uh, another good example would be carrots. Carrots are one that we grow uh, 16 per square foot, 16 per square foot. Um, a lot of people don't like growing carrots just because the seeds are so itty bitty, teeny tiny, and they're a huge pain. I really like growing them though. As much of the pain that they are, it's it's a lot of payoff. Carrots are delicious. Kids love them. Um, and so using something like this, you could even make something like this at home fairly easily with just a piece of cardboard and you measure and space things out appropriately. Um, but using something like this to plant those seeds are, is super, super easy. Uh, my daughter likes doing it with me. What we'll do is we'll actually lay this chart this car piece of cardboard down and I have a bunch of skewers and we'll stick the skewers into the dirt through all of 16 of the holes that we're supposed to use we pull the cardboard off and then we just put one seed down at a time where the skewer was then we cover it with a little bit of vermiculite that we have um, but in the end you get like this wonderful thick lush carpet of carrots growing, all the green tops. Huge benefit to growing food densely like this without relying on rows is that it the plants will take over that square and you won't have to worry so much about weeds. Weeding is, well, not entirely eliminated, but it's significantly reduced. The other big benefit is it makes watering, watering far easier. It's you, you're using your water uh, far more efficiently. There's a lot less waste because Every area that can grow plants has plants in it. So even if your water spills over and goes somewhere where it shouldn't, 
um, it's going to get used by a plant. It's going to get used by a plant, right? Um, so like I said, there are minor variations. So the vast majority of plants follow the square foot and grow in either one, four, nine, or 16 plants per square foot. Um, there are ones, like I said, beans, bean, vining beans that you would grow on like a trellis. Um, there's eight per square foot, and you just use the middle eight of the 16. Um, another one that's a little bit different, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this a little bit later, um, there are plants that will use more than one square foot. So something like a zucchini plant. Um, they actually recommend that you grow one zucchini plant in a nine square foot square, so a three by three square. Um, I will talk a little bit more about that a bit later. Um, but yeah, there are variations. Now, um, the big part of Mel's methodology uh, is like he likes growing plants in raised beds, raised beds. Um, you can see here, you know, turn mine. My garden here is one great big raised bed. I do a variation. I do a variation. Um, he recommended four by four feet. The logic being um, that a human being, most human beings can reach about two feet into the garden without any issue. So if you have a four by four foot square from any side, you should be able to reach in to the middle of your garden bed makes it a lot easier for weeding, makes it a lot easier for planting, and allows you to grow things densely, densely. Um, I'm going to share a screen. Hold on here. Um, where's my tab? Oh, I lost the tab. I have a ton of pictures as well, too, that I have put together. Um, I accidentally closed that tab. You just bear with me one moment. I'm going to go to my albums. There we go. Square foot gardening. Um, there we go. I can share that. Chrome tab. There we go. There we go. So this was what my garden originally looked like when I first put it together. You can see here in this photo. Um, this is when I initially put the beds together. Uh, where I put my vegetable garden, my square foot garden, is on a slight incline, so I had to make uh, my garden boxes uh, angled. You can kind of see that in there. Um, and I started off with three, two four by four foot garden boxes, and then one two by four foot garden box. Um, and then over on the left there, you can see a lot of the materials that they recommend, and I'll talk about that. Um, in terms of filling your vegetable bed or garden bed with with soil, with dirt, um, there is uh, a recipe that they recommend, um, which is basically, right now, the modified version, the current version that they recommend is a third of your volume of dirt is uh, peat moss, a third of it compost, um, and a third of it vermiculite. Uh, the original recipe, the original soil combination was a little bit different, but you can see the supplies I have out there. Um, I have uh, peat moss in those nice big rectangular uh, bags. I have the vermiculite up on top, sitting on top of them, and then the wheelbarrow actually had some sand. Um, that was one of the one of the original recommended materials that they put in your square foot garden. They recommended a little bit of sand. Um, but you can see those boxes. I started off with four by foot by four foot boxes. Um, and this was one of the modifications that I uh, initially did. Uh, after a few years, I kind of realized it was a bit of a waste having two feet of space between each, each box, each bed. Uh, so I just eliminated it and made it into a four foot by, I think it's now 15 foot row. Um, my logic being is that it's still two feet from the two long edges to reach into the middle. I can still reach into the middle. I just don't necessarily need to do it from the sides. Um, but if you look online, uh, there are tons of variations to that four foot by four foot box. Like I said, um, not everyone sticks with just four feet by four feet. And it's usually though they stick with at least one of the measured lengths being four feet. Um, some people, what they will do is they'll take like a large area and they'll divide it up into four foot by four foot squares and then put wood over the space in between so that they can walk in between 
those areas. It's another technique that I've seen quite a bit. I actually did that one um, with my first square foot garden in my first house. I can go to that picture and I'll share it with you. There we go. So I pulled that one up and I'll share that picture. Chrome tab. There we go. So you can see on this one, this was my first square foot garden that I had set up. Um, again, I have the raised boxes and each square of soil is four feet by four feet. Um, but it being longer, all I did was just put a board across uh, to mark off where each four foot section was. And that way too, I could climb onto the board. I could walk onto the board and still reach in as necessary. Um, but again, it was one of those things I quickly realized I it wasn't 100% necessary to maintain that so long as one of the two lengths is four feet, you can still reach in and get to the middle. There we go. So I talked quite a bit about the beds, the beds. Um, for the wood, that's one good thing. Now you can see on my garden here, my technique for getting the garden boxes in, any garden box in, um, you can see I have wood stakes that I drive in. So basically I will make the box in whatever size that it is, four foot by four foot or four foot by 15 foot, whatever size is necessary. Um, and I'll get it down on the ground. I'll usually dig out, if there's grass there, I'll dig out the grass just so the box sits a little bit better on the ground, goes into the ground a bit. Um, and then I use these wood stakes at various points just to kind of help reinforce the box. Wood that you want to use, um, usually something that isn't isn't treated, no pressure treated wood, um, because there's chemicals in that and that will leach into your plants um, and you don't want to be eating those chemicals. A lot of them aren't very good for you. Um, so you use natural wood and it decays over time and eventually you will have to replace the, your, the walls of your garden boxes and your beds. Um, but I use wooden stakes to help reinforce them, give them something to lean up against over time because the weight of all that dirt in there will also push out. Um, there's actually, uh, you can kind of see it's bowed, my garden box is bowed in the middle a little bit. It's kind of hard to see. Not, but if we were a little bit higher up, you could see that. Um, so I use garden stakes to reinforce things. They're also handy. Um, you can tie string off them if you have like pets or something that might want to hop into your garden box. You want to keep them out. Um, or you can tie on uh, like pie plates and things like that. Bright, shiny, noisy things that clang around in the wind to help scare away birds and squirrels and other pests. Um, just having extra stakes around your garden in general um, can be super, super handy and extra useful. Now... That's kind of it in a nutshell, square foot gardening. You're basically growing things four feet by square, four feet in a bed, raised up off the ground a little bit. Use a special soil combination uh, and you will grow either one, four, nine, or 16 plants in each square foot. Um, and there are lots of positives. I already kind of mentioned, oh, I think I see a question. Hold on here before I get into that. Let's go. Oh. Someone said the sharing of photos doesn't appear to be working. I apologize for that. I'll try not to use them then. My apologies. All right, so let's go back to my banners. There we go. Um, there's lots and lots of positives uh, to square foot gardening, and I already mentioned a few uh, in general. Um, maintenance overall is much, 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 much easier. Um, like I said, watering, you don't have to worry about water going places where you don't necessarily want it to or, or evaporating. Um, it goes everywhere and everything soaks it up. Um, weeding is a lot easier because you're growing plants a lot more, a lot more densely. Uh, there's fewer opportunities for weeds to take off and flourish. Um, yeah, in terms of weeding as well too, like with the raised bed, having a raised bed is a lot easier uh, ergonomically, you know, to get around it and things like that. Um, another big positive is there's a lot less seed waste. The, the, uh, the common technique of growing things in rows, you know, uh, you'll often, they'll, you know, people will just dig up a row, get the hill of dirt going, uh, open up a package of seeds and then spread them out. And then as the plants start to grow, thin them out. So pull out the ones that aren't necessary until you get to a spacing that you're happy with where you can grow as much food as possible. Um, 
but with square foot gardening and using, you know, like a template or just, you know, the general guide in general, um, you waste far less seeds. There's far less thinning out of plants to go uh, to do. Um, I rarely plant more than one seed per hole. Rarely, rarely, rarely. Some seeds I'll do it once in a while, like carrots are a good example, because sometimes it's hard to tell whether or not you have a full carrot seed or if it's just a little bit of chaff um, from like the outside shell. So uh, I often, well, I, every once in a while, I'll plant two carrot seeds in there, but for the most of the time, I have absolutely no need for it whatsoever. And I find, you know, you get like a nice big package of seeds and you fill up your section of your garden that you want to grow in, uh, you'll have lots of leftover. And seeds keep, as long as you keep them in a cool, dark place, they'll keep for years and years and years. They'll start uh, germinating less and less and less. So like, you know, after two or three years, only 90% of them will germinate and 80% and whatever. Um, but usually by the time you get a few years into the future, you've used them all up. Uh, so seed packages last much, much longer um, and far less seed waste, far less thinning out. Um, another huge positive, our pests are a lot easier to handle. I cannot recommend raised beds enough just for dealing with pests. Um, keeping out mice, moles, voles, rabbits, squirrels, uh, just a basic raised bed does a lot. There's other things as well too, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later in my uh, adaptations section. I'm gonna talk about things that I've figured out to do a little bit differently. Um, but in general, pests are far easier to handle, even with growing things in a box like this and again, using the stakes around the edge. It doesn't take a whole lot just to throw some chicken wire around your garden. Um, and you can just staple it or tie it to the stakes to put it up and it comes down fairly easily as well too. So like I said, pests are far easier. Um, and I also mentioned this briefly already, ergonomics are far better than most gardening techniques. So most gardening techniques, you know, you're growing flat on the ground. Uh, when you're doing weeding, you're on your hands and knees with raised beds and raised boxes. Uh, just getting that, your your dirt, like, you know, 6 to 12 inches further up off the ground is a lot easier on your back. You can sit down quite a bit. My daughter and I, when we do carrots, we'll do it along the short edge. Um, and we just sit side by side and slowly shift down the length of the garden box uh, as we're planting our carrot seeds. And we're just sitting there. And it feels so much better. It doesn't hurt nearly as much as, you know, having you to be on your hands and knees and elbows. Um, also, when you, with a lot of square foot gardening, when it comes to vining plants, you try to grow them up a trellis. And you can do a lot of gardening standing up when you grow things up, when you grow the vining plants up trellises, right? A lot of picking and stuff like that. Um, you don't have to squat down for or deal with it. Um, so, yeah. So lots of little positives to square foot gardening, aside from the fact that you're growing food very, very densely, very, very densely. Um, there are negatives. There are negatives. There are things that don't work quite so well or things that I don't like um, or things that I've adapted over time. They're not necessarily, oh, if I spelt negatives properly, that would help. <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, now I lost it all together. Positives. There we go. There are negatives. Um, but I was saying there's not, they're not all negatives per se. It just might be little things, little quirks. Um, if you read Mel's book, um, just about every edition of Mel's book, he dramatically, dramatically underestimates the amount of water is needed. Um, so when I first started doing following the square foot gardening technique, I did like everything exactly as I said in the book, um, mainly it's because it was a learning experience for me. And I figured uh, if something didn't work out, I would adapt it the next year. That's probably my favorite part about gardening is that you just adapt next year. If something doesn't work, you try something different the next year. Um, and one of the things I quickly learned was that uh, the amount of water he recommends for the plants is way too little way 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 too little um i think for you know, something like tomato plants or something i'm gonna i'm gonna quote it wrong so don't hold me to this 100 percent um but something like tomato plants he says you only need to put on a cup of water every day not that i measured out a cup of water um but like tomato plants love water 
They love being drenched. They will grow so much better. And it became fairly obvious to me um, that he kind of underestimates the amount of water needed, uh, just based on observing my garden after a rain. Because um, what I often found is after I had a good soak from a rain, the next day the garden just kind of exploded. And it was fairly obvious. Even my wife noticed it that, uh, you know, after a rain, every rain, the garden like doubled in size. Um, so from once I kind of started to notice that part pattern, um, just start watering far more frequently. Um, like watering every day first thing in the morning is not bad whatsoever. Not bad whatsoever. Um, another thing, another little quirk, regularly adding mulch is extremely important with square foot gardening. Uh, what you'll find because you're growing everything so densely, uh, the plants just soak up all those nutrients in the ground. Um, so crop rotation between years, so growing plants in different locations each year becomes extremely important. But even throughout your growing season, I would definitely recommend uh, throwing on a little extra compost throughout there. Um, or if you're into it, putting in fertilizer. I'm not a big fan of using fertilizers. I like doing things as free or cheaply as possible but some people are big fans of fertilizer and if you are definitely um using using more than what you normally would uh when doing square foot gardening just because you know you're growing everything so dense and close and there's more plants in competition for less nutrients um so you don't want your plants competing with each other you want them to out compete the weeds so that you don't have to weed um but you don't want them pulling nutrients from each other. So uh, adding extra nutrients throughout your growing season, like just once a month, um, will dramatically, dramatically improve your garden. And like I mentioned before as well too, rotating your crops um, between years is extremely important. I, I made the mistake of growing tomatoes uh, in the same spot twice one year. And I had that, that brown wilt that you get on the bottom of the tomatoes that indicates a lack of calcium. And that's just because the plant sucked up on the plant plants the previous year sucked up all the calcium all the calcium out of the ground um another one another thing to watch out for weeds can still be a pain as much as mel advocates in his book that you know weeding is so much easier um you still have to be careful with it uh early in the season uh there's lots of weeds that will take off and overwhelm your plants so you still got to pull those guys out um, but also the slower growing plants, the slower growing plants. So like, especially with carrots, um, I find uh, that you have to be extra careful with the weeds because the carrots grow, they take forever to germinate, take forever to get big. Um, and in that time, weeds can grow so much quicker. Uh, you just got to keep an extra eye on, say, your carrots. Um, another, another big downside, certain plants do not work well at all, at all, at all, at all. Um, so in here, I grow in my garden right now, and in general, um, I grow onions, garlic, tomatoes, peppers. I like to grow what I call a salsa garden because then I will can it and uh, have a ton of salsa to give away and to eat throughout the year. Um, what else I grow? I grow carrots, beans, both bush and pole beans, so the vining stuff, um, cucumbers as well too, beets, uh, and just about anything else. And, uh, but those are, that's the vast majority of it. Some years I'll rotate different plants through. I'll grow broccoli or cauliflower or cabbages and things like that. Um, but those for that first batch, those are by far the main ones that I grow. Uh, in Mel's book, he says you can grow just about anything, just about anything by a square foot gardening. Um, and that's entirely debatable. Um, certain plants, especially vining plants, so small vining plants like beans and cucumbers grow just fine. And the thing is, you're going to have to grow them up. You're going to have to grow them up. Um, a lot of organic farms and things like that, the vining plants grow on the ground, right? Um, so here in my garden, you can see I actually have a rail because my garden is close to my fence. Um, I built arms, cantilever arms. Uh, and I put a rail on them, and I basically grow my vining plants up to that rail, up to that rail. So I will use maybe the edge of my garden box, and I will screw a stake or a bamboo pole into the edge. And as the plant gets big enough, I'll start twisting it up the bamboo pole and whatnot, and then I'll string 
uh, string up to the top. Or sometimes I'll just use string from the edge of the garden box all the way up to the top. I often do that with cucumbers or the beans. Tomatoes, I usually grow up a steak to start off with just because they get so heavy. I like to have that wooden steak for them to be the base. Um, so vining plants, basically in square foot gardening, you have to grow up. You have to grow up. There's no choice for it to spread out. Um, in Mel's book, he says you can grow watermelon and pumpkins and squash, or various like butternut squash and cantaloupe and all the melons and things like that. Um, I have tried that many times and I've never had success. Never have had success. Um, I have seen some people grow um, cantaloupes successfully by a square foot garden uh, and butternut squash, like the bigger, bigger squash. Um, kind of the medium size, but pumpkin and watermelon never. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do it successfully via the square foot gardening technique. Um, it's because they take up so much space. Uh, they're such prolific growers. The leaves take over everything. They drown out all the plants, the plants that you want. Um, and the weight, melons in particular, melons and butternut squash. Um, I've seen some people set up like crazy hammock situations or they have, you know, a wood trellis and then they, as the fruit starts to grow and gets bigger and bigger. Um, they have these little hammocks that they can attach to it. And it requires a lot of effort. So it's not impossible for some things, um, but it's. I would definitely not recommend doing that if it's your first time. I would definitely not recommend that. Um, those plants take a lot more effort and some of them are just impossible in general. Another one that I've had a ton, a ton of issues with uh, our zucchini. I like growing zucchini. I think it's a fun vegetable. Um, it's an easy one to grow. It's a very easy one to grow. Um, and according to Mel in his book, in the Square Foot Gardening book, uh, like I mentioned, it's one of those odd ones where you have to grow it in a three foot by three foot square. So it requires nine square feet to grow in and you plant the plant in the middle, in the very middle of the three by three square. Um, I have never found it to stay within uh, nine square feet. Basically, my zucchini plants have always taken over uh, the four, the full four, four by four or 16 square foot section. And even then the leaves go even farther. Um, zucchini plants do vine ever so slightly. It's a very stumpy, viney root thing that kind of grows out as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the plant does slowly travel over time. Um, and the leaves are so massive and it just grows so big. Or maybe I'm just really good at growing zucchini, but I don't find that it works well um, based on his instructions. When I do grow zucchini, it's usually like separate and in its own little section somewhere in my yard or in a different garden, not necessarily in my main square foot garden uh, vegetable plot. But all of that is stuff that you will learn through trial and error. Like I said, my favorite part about gardening is kind of learning from year to year and trying things a little bit differently. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the modifications, some of the modifications that I have done that have worked out. Um, one of my favorite ones uh, is basically to line the bottom of your square foot garden with chicken wire, chicken wire. So I have, I have some leftover stuff here. Um, you can buy chicken wire in all sorts of different gauges, um, and the whole size can vary significantly. Um, this stuff here, I have it kind of taped up, pointy as heck when you cut it, and it's easy to jab yourself with, um, but it saves so much effort when it comes to pests, when it comes to pests. So here you can kind of see, this is quarter inch chicken wire. So each one of those holes is a quarter of an inch quarter of an inch by a quarter of an inch in size. Um, and basically what I do, it comes in larger strips than this. I get it in the two foot sections. I basically line the bottom of my garden boxes with quarter inch chicken wire. So when I make them, I'll make my four foot by four foot or four foot by 15 foot garden box. Um, I'll flip it upside down or over on its side and then I will lay out the chicken wire and staple it all around the edges, all around the edges. And then uh, where the seam is in the middle, I will just take some extra wire and weave it back and forth to make this solid chicken wire base on my garden boxes. Um, the reason for it is to keep out pests, keep out pests. Um, so like I said, having a raised box helps quite a bit to deter pests. They still will go in. 
they still will go in. But I found um, is that they will still burrow underneath, right? That was a very common way for them to get in is that they would dig under my garden box wall, under the soil, just a couple of inches, uh, and then go straight up and they'll, you know, they would nest in there. I would have, I would find the occasional mouse or vole nest uh, in the garden. When you line the bottom with the quarter inch chicken wire, it's too small for them to go through too small uh so they, they can't fit their head through they can't chew through the chicken wire because it's it's metal and it's galvanized it's not going to rust or anything like that it's going to be there forever and ever and ever um and it almost overnight eliminated all pests all pests like i have no mice no voles going into my garden now it does help i do have an outdoor cat that likes to sleep in the garden and he tends to keep things away um but before before i before i started lining bottom of my garden boxes of the chicken wire every once in a while you'd find you know a little hole dug in and there would be an animal living in there i've not had that ever since ever since um so i definitely i strongly recommend using this stuff like i said you have to be careful it's sharp and pointy on the edges i've cut myself i've jabbed myself many many times doing it um but you only do it that first time you set it up and that's good forever you don't have to worry about it ever ever again um so i strongly recommend Strongly recommend doing the quarter inch chicken wire. Um, another one that I mentioned, water far more frequently uh, than what Mel recommends in his book. Um, every morning, I usually go out and give the plants a good soak. I didn't today because they had a good soak all day yesterday because of all the rain. Um, I'm actually getting into, I'll show you here, just across. There we go. I'm setting up. Uh, a decent watering system so this is these are going to be three rain barrels i have 90 percent of the parts together because of the pandemic i'm still waiting on a few more things from the hardware store but i'm setting up a nice big bank of three rain barrels that are going to be fed from my downspout my busiest downspout on my house and i'm going to be setting up a drip line from the rain barrels into my garden uh, that i'll be able to control with a valve uh, and then later iterations, I'm going to ideally put on an electronic valve so that I'll be able to control it with my smartphone. I'll just be able to water the garden with the touch of my smartphone. Um, and I'll be able to water far more frequently, far, far more frequently. So one of those things, too, where, uh, you, you know, you got to keep an eye on the weather and things like that. Like I said, I didn't water today just because it rained so much. Um, but, you know, on more dry, arid days, I'll water two or three times, especially when I have tomatoes. Uh, Watering two or three times a day is almost necessary when we get up to like those, you know, 40 degree days with humidex in August. And uh, it will it will do a number on your plants, but they will survive and thrive so long as they have enough water. Um, another one, clustering plants into groups, I definitely recommend. In Mel's original book, um, he recommended growing different things almost in each square in each square in your square foot garden. I don't do that so much. I have not had nearly as many issues. So you can see here, I'm growing uh, first year garlic and onions. Um, and I have them all grown fairly densely. Garlic is in a four, uh, no, a two foot by two foot square. Um, the onions I'm growing in about a two foot by six, uh, two foot by three foot square. Um, behind that, I'm growing a row of tomato plants and I'm growing a row of pepper plants in front of them. Um, I like clustering them into groups just because of their unique watering requirements. Um, it's a lot easier to deal with the watering. Like I said, tomatoes need a lot more water. So you have all the tomatoes together. It's a lot easier just to dump all the water together. Um, so when I do install a drip line and things like that, I'll install drip line, the, the drip line uh, outlets that will fire up more water around the tomatoes as opposed to maybe less water around the garlic and onions. They still need water, but not necessarily as much. Um, he likes that, that diversity to help with the weeds, to help uh, block them out. Because when you grow a lot of, you know, single plants in one square foot, um, it does give more opportunities for weeds to grow. There are ways around that. Although I find like growing one plant per square foot, it's a lot easier for weeding, especially when you have little trowels and things like that, a little rake that you can just put over the dirt real quick, um, pulls out the weeds super fast. And it's a lot easier to avoid the plants when there's only one per square foot. But you can also put down like all sorts of fabric and materials to block out weeds as well too. There's lots of little solutions that you can figure out with or work with. Um, and then finally, um, 
Now this is one that I do quite a bit with carrots. Um, what I do, like I have mentioned multiple times, uh, carrots are slow growing and the weeds are fast growing and weeds can quickly overtake carrots. Um, so what I often do when I grow carrots in the section of the garden that I want to grow garret, the carrots, I will move, I'll dig out, you know, four to six inches of soil off the top. I'll move it to another part of the garden. I don't get rid of it. I just put it somewhere else. Uh, and I'll take fresh dirt, like literally from a bag, fresh soil that I bought at the hardware store. Um, fill in that section that I dug out uh, and plant the carrots into there. I find it's a hundred times easier to get small, slower growing plants growing uh, and not dealing with the weeds when you put down fresh soil in that section of the garden, just on the top a little bit, just enough to get rid of the seeds from the weeds. Uh, put down some, a nice layer of fresh soil uh, just to make it a lot easier for them to take off. And that was a problem that we encountered about three years ago. My daughter and I planted carrots twice um, and both times the weeds overtook the plants like faster than we could pick it out. And then also it gets to a case where uh, when you pull out the weed, you're pulling out the carrot plant with it because their roots get all intertwined and it doesn't it didn't matter like we were doing it every day um and we we could not get carrots to grow successfully uh so we did it twice had no success and then the third time out of frustration i just dug a layer of soil out put the dirt down put fresh dirt down and had no issues we had a nice batch of carrots by the end of the season ever since then that's what we've done uh and i definitely recommend that for smaller plants, smaller plants, smaller, slower growing plants. So uh, radishes and beets uh, and carrots, um, even sometimes some lettuce as well too. It takes a little while for it to get going uh, and weeds can grow super fast. Um, so yeah, I have just talked a lot. My mouth is kind of dry. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a tour just to show a little bit. So I sh showed you the, the the quarter inch wire uh, mesh chicken wire that I use. I showed you my uh, planting guide that I use. Before this, I was just kind of guessing. Um, if you look online, a lot of people do different things. Um, some people will literally put down little strips of wood. Um, one technique that I did once, once in a while, um, you can kind of see around the edge here. Nope, there we go. You can kind of see around the edge here. I would put nails in every foot. Uh, actually, no, this one was every two feet because this was, I gave my kids two feet of space. Um, and then you run a line in between. Some people will do that every foot and they'll make a nice grid with string or twine uh, and they'll base their planting on that. Um, what else do I got here? So you can see here I've got. I got my onions, I got my garlic, I got my peppers and tomatoes going. Um, I have some leftover onions that kind of came up, came up, uh, ones that I missed when I harvested last season, at the end of the season. But a few other plants I need to do. I have, I have a bunch of beans in the ground, they just haven't sprouted yet, but I'm basically going to be growing uh, pole beans along the back there to go up to uh, my little support. I have an Oscar cat there watching my garden <laughs> we have some strawberry plants that we that uh i had a previous year that uh, we just kind of let grow out of the garden and they're still going um what else do i got here i don't know I've got my garden shed and got all my got all sorts of stakes and supplies um all sorts of buckets i use lots of buckets sometimes i will grow some plants in buckets kind of to do a very similar sort of square foot gardening but like in different locations um i like growing potatoes in buckets because potatoes are ones that you'd like to mound dirt over time so i'll just fill in a little bit of dirt in the bucket plant my potatoes and once the plants get big enough i'll dump in more dirt just inside the bucket um they're fun to move around and things like that. You can also harvest potatoes a little bit more frequently and earlier in the season, and then you're not disrupting your other plants. Um, I have all sorts of supplies, but every gardener does. Um, oh, I think I see. It's most of the sun. It's a little better. There we go. I think I see a comment or question. He says, are you using Mel's mix or bags of potting soil? So when I do the, when I do, uh, when I fill up a new garden box, I will do Mel's mix, but I will do it myself. 
I found it's just cheaper and you can go out and buy uh, Mel's mix from some places. They will sell it all pre-mixed is combination of, of peat moss, vermiculite and compost. Um, but I will do it myself. I will usually just make it myself. Compost I often just get from the dump uh, when they have the free giveaway or from my own compost bin. Uh, vermiculite I'll buy from a different place. Uh, peat moss I'll buy from a different place. It's usually whatever I can find on sale from whatever hardware store. Um, but if you're in a pinch, if you want to grow it like on your balcony and you have, you know, one of these square foot garden pots, um, buying it from premix is probably just fine. Uh, but when I do my carrots, I just use regular, regular potting soil, basically. Um, I want fresh, clean stuff without any weeds or anything in it. So that's when I take off the top little bit. And then it all get, ends up getting mixed up in there at the end of the season anyways, when I, you know, turn over the beds and stuff like that and get ready for the winter. Uh, so it all gets mixed in there anyways. And I just consider that kind of like adding cleaner, nicer compost <laughs> to my garden every year. Um, that was a good question. Thank you, Ross. If there are any other questions. Type them now. Type them into the comments for YouTube or Facebook. Um, other things. So I've played quite a bit with trellises. Um, I kind of insinuated before. Uh, before I put up the cantilever arms and the pipe across to tie things onto. I was a big fan of uh, using uh, galvanized uh, pipe. So like the stuff that you use for uh, wiring, conduit wiring, uh, you can get that from the hardware store fairly cheaply. Um, and I would also buy a couple of PVC elbows that would fit perfectly nice and tight on the top. So I'd stick two in or I would drill them into the side of the garden box um, and then use the PVC elbows on the top and then put one across. Uh, it kind of fell out of favor of that. Just when you're trying to grow uh, plants up on a trellis, um, I like being able to reach through. Uh, and when you have like this square, this rectangle, and you grow like a mesh or you put a mesh on and things like that, uh, it just made it a lot harder for weeding and getting around the plants. So I started just doing this pull across the top and then I usually just run lines. I use or run just like individual lines, and I twist plants up the line. I've liked that a lot more because it's been a lot easier for weeding and getting in between the plants and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think I've talked. I've talked a lot. <laughs> like I mentioned too, I'm moving slowly towards getting to a point where I'm going to be doing uh, watering with uh, ideally a smartphone and just hit a button and the water comes out of my rain barrels and my plants get all wet fairly easily. Big advantage to that is that I'll be able to water while I am away on vacation. So we can go away for a week at a time and not worry about having to ask a neighbor to come over and water the plants for us. Um, although I have no issue with that because I usually pay them off with lots of fresh vegetables by the end of the season. Um, that's just be one less thing I'll have to inconvenience others with. So, um, yeah, like I said, gardening is one of those things that's that you learn, you learn a year at a time. And it's kind of fun, kind of fun because you you take enough pictures over time, you'll see a lot of changes. Unfortunate, the photo sharing wasn't working because I had a whole photo album full of stuff. I had my first square foot garden in there that I had set up. Uh, I had a few iterations of the square foot garden that I had uh, that I have here at this house um, and the various other things as well too. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Um, probably my favorite part about square foot gardening, um, all the ergonomics and the ease and things like that. It's awesome for kids. It is awesome for kids. Um, probably some of my favorite memories growing up would be going over to my grandparents uh, and spending time in there garden their victory garden their square foot garden uh wandering around just picking out random you know snow peas and eating them uh they had rabbits raspberry bushes growing around the outside um you know just gorging myself on good stuff on good stuff and uh, it was very important for me to do my own victory garden my own square foot garden my own backyard because i wanted my kids to kind of have uh that similar experience and square foot gardening is awesome it is awesome for the little guys. It is fantastic. It is so, and I had pictures of my kids helping 
Uh, like I mentioned, my daughter and I will just sit side by side and, you know, work away and spend an hour planting carrots. And we have a season of carrots planted into the ground. Um, it's so ergonomic for them because they're, they're little, they're close to the ground. Uh, and we bring it up, you know, six inches, maybe, you know, a minor amount for an adult, but it's a huge amount for a kid. Um, and like they can walk around, they can play in it. They get a better understanding of, you know, the source of their food, um, the effort that's required in growing food, how much, how, how bad waste is and how, yeah, just all sorts of things, all sorts of things, you know, get closer to the nature and, you know, the experience animals and the frustration of dealing with, you know, pests and things like that. And, um, yeah, there, there's tons of benefits to square foot gardening, but probably by far my favorite is uh, the amount of education kids get out of it, the amount of fun that they have. So I think on that note, don't see any other questions. I'm going to end there. I'm going to end there. So thank you very much for coming on out. I hope you learned a little bit. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, by all means, email me. Um, my email address, I don't have a banner for it. Let me see if I can make a banner for it real quick. <laughs> my email address is jgertz, J-G-O-E-R-T-Z, at WPL.ca. Let's see if I can throw that up there. Ah, there's my email address. Um, fire me an email. I love talking about gardening. I love showing off my garden. Um, I'm actually running one for the library because we usually do a kids gardening program during the summer, although with COVID, um, things are a little bit wonky donkey, but I still am running the garden over in uh, the Sunnydale Friendship Community Garden. There is a plot for WPL. Um, I've set it up to be very kid friendly as well too. Um, I'm going to be growing food there, all publicly accessible and viewable. And I'm going to be doing a garden program for kids this summer as well too, although it will be done remotely. Um, and that's it for me. See you guys. Fire me an email if you have any questions. And hopefully I'll see you at other programs in the future.